How is everybody this morning? We sure have had some cloudy, cold, windy, rainy weather, haven't we? But it's been a blessing. We thank the Lord for it. I'm not complaining because I tell you, that grass that uh, John and Clayton got down and working on, boy, I tell you, that's going to grow next spring. It's going to be great. We got rain coming up. Looks like uh, our rain coming the next three or four days here. And thankful that it's not snow. But it sure is good to see everybody this morning. And we welcome the folks that are watching us by way of uh, live stream. We're glad to, that you've joined with us. I know that we have, and you probably don't know, we've got several folks that are uh, across, like, Virginia and Tennessee and Kentucky and as well as here in Missouri that live stream our worship services with us and uh, several of our members that aren't able to come live stream. Some couldn't get up early this... Oh, I forgot I wasn't going to say that uh, this morning. Uh, but, uh, and speaking of that, by the way, if you want to be here on time next week, you know, it's, it's already sneaked up on us. Next weekend is when the clocks fall back an hour. So next Saturday, uh, you're going to gain an hour. Uh, move your clock back before you go to bed next Saturday night because uh, if you don't, you'll come to 8.30 and you'll be here at uh, what time? 7.30. You'll be here before the rest of us get here. So uh, we... Uh, be sure to do that, take care of that. And uh, next Sunday night, we're going to have an evening service next Sunday night ahead of the election with uh, soup and sandwiches, 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall. So if you'd like to come, bring soup, sandwiches, whatever. I'm sure there's going to be plenty. You probably won't need to, but those of you that want to bring and fix your favorite soup, bring it to share, and we'll have that at 6 o'clock. We'll finish our fellowship and eating and things, and then we'll make our way probably up here and have prayer uh, for the election. We'll vote for, every, we, everybody needs to get out and vote, guys. They, they do. And uh, we've all got our opinions and different things, but it's important to get out and to vote, to mark that. And I, next Sunday, Lord willing, I'll be preaching a message on the danger of neglect. And part of that's going to be about the seriousness of what uh, the voting is about, what, what's taking place. Because relatively, not to get ahead of the game, I think it's a matter of choosing life over death. You know, I think the abortion issues, the things that are there are really big. I think we need to pray tomorrow for the uh, Senate as they vote to elect uh, uh, and uh, vote on uh, Amy Barrett. Uh, as the new justice, and I, I'm excited about that. I have never seen such an outstanding candidate, man or woman, that as smart as what she is and well qualified. So I hope that you're proud of that too, you know, that as we look at this. So a lot of things we need to pray for, and of course, this COVID and sickness and things, people have been sick. Uh, Dixie asked that we continue praying for her neighbor, Linda Cobble. I want to lift her up to the Lord in prayer. I am so glad to see Michelle Stewart here today. I was so worried. Uh, thank, praise the Lord. Thank all of you all for your prayers. She was sick last Sunday, and she's, of course, out there greeting and welcoming folks and giving bulletins and things. So we appreciate, John, you all and your family and all of you. Thank the Lord for watching over you. Um, also pray for a friend of Deborah and I is back in Virginia whose sister passed away. Um, this past week, uh, they watch us, like I say, live stream here. I tell them they're, we're, they're, they're a mission church off of Orchard Crest um, there in Virginia, but we want to lift them up to the Lord in prayer, the Pendleton family and uh, others uh, in the loss of their sister, who I had the privilege, actually, of leading to the Lord at the church where I was, a non-denominational church uh, there in that area. Uh, she was 56 years old, I believe, and uh, just had many complications. She did not pass away, to my knowledge, of COVID. Uh, she had other complications and things, has for several years. And we want to pray for all of our homebound folks, lift them up to the Lord in prayer. Do you have concerns or requests this morning? 
anyone other that I failed, that missed or someone. Uh, we cover that with the unspoken request. I'm sure you got something on your heart that we can lift that up to the Lord. Pray with me, please. Thank you, Father, for blessing us today with uh, folks here to worship you. I thank you for our church and the faithfulness of this body, Lord, and we're excited about the days ahead of what you have for us. And we pray, Father, for our nation. We pray for healing, not just uh, physically, but emotionally, Lord. All the things bring peace and joy back in our country. Uh, that pursuit of happiness that we say in our Constitution. And help us to continue, Lord, to find the liberty and love that we need in serving you. And as you speak to our hearts today through the message, the singing, the songs, we have come here to just, Lord, empty ourselves so that we can be filled with your Holy Spirit. So bless us now as we come into your presence. Bless Brother Philip as he leads us uh, in the singing and, and the ladies that help and all of our congregation. And those that are listening, Lord, may you touch hearts today. And if there's a lost soul, may they be saved. And as us as believers, help to renew our spirits, refresh us as we walk a little closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Brother Phil. Thank you. Well, good morning, Orchard Crest. Glad to have you here this morning. You know there's no greater story than that of Jesus and his love for us. So we're going to sing about that this morning. So if you would, let's stand and sing, I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus. I Stand Amazed. I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus. Yeah. 
He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care.
Thank you, brother. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them, if you would, with me, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. We'll be reading in verse 15 through verse 17. The Gospel of John, chapter 15. The title of the message today is, Don't Compromise Your Convictions. And in saying that is that I'm assuming that it's the good convictions, the good things. I can just hear somebody right now saying, well, you know, uh, if they're doing whatever they're doing and, and, and maybe it's whether it's wrong or evil or dark or stuff, that they're just convicted by it, I'm going to live my life the way I want to and do the things I want to do. The Holy Spirit, according to John chapter 16, convicts us of things wrong within our life. Jesus said he'll guide you into all truth. He'll tell you about me. He's going to convict and he's going to judge. And he does that. That's why he's in the world. That's why the Holy Spirit came. And then he indwells the believer's heart. But to do that, we were all born with a conscience. You know, that would make a good sermon. I, I think, uh, the Lord, I'll be dealing with that here before long. The death of a conscience. I think that's coming. So, not next week, but how about the next one? Two weeks away. So we're all born with a conscience. And, but you know, you can... Actually, you know, you have a conscience that when you steal the cookie when you're little and things and you hide it for a while and you can't, you know, and they say, did you take that cookie or did, did you get that money off my dresser? Did you do this or that? And, you know, or did you take that pencil or do, I mean, I've done a few things as a little fella. Somebody else probably made me do it. it probably older kids uh, or something. But, you know, but we all, you know, that little sneaky thing with doing stuff, you know, and uh-uh, you know, I didn't do it. But conscience works in your heart and your mind. It's kind of like alarm going off that reminds you that you know it's automatically it tells you this wrong. Kind of like when you say something it hurts somebody's feelings. Conscience is there. Conscience and the Holy Spirit's not the same. Of what the Holy Spirit works and activates the conscience, and you can grieve the Holy Spirit and 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 therefore. That conviction won't be there. When you grieve the Holy Spirit, there's different things that takes place. But in the conscience, you can sear or kill your conscience. And sometimes some people don't have the conviction who aren't saved because they don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And if they don't listen to the word of God, they don't hear what God is saying uh, to their hearts through the Bible, through preaching, through the Holy Spirit. They just, he's there knocking at the heart, the door, and wanting them to open so they can be saved. So they could be at the point to where maybe, you know, they just go on and do the evil that they do and not worry about compromising convictions. If it feels good, do it. Heard that? You know, that we just go ahead and then later on. But it's a good warning sign, dear friend, that when you do something wrong, that you have a conviction about it. When you say something wrong, you have a conviction about it within your life. That's a good thing that God instills in us. So I'd say don't kill your conscience and, and listen to the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit within your heart. Listen to what the Lord says in John chapter 15, verse 15 through 17. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. And, and that's important to see is that Jesus held nothing back. He told his disciples, the apostles, he said, all things that I've heard from my Father, I've told you. There's not anything new or whatever. He's prepared them and let them know. And notice verse 16. You did not choose me, but what? Notice, but I chose you. You did not choose me, I chose you. And then after he chose them, what did he do? Look at verse 16. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. So 
Is there evidence that ought to be there that when the seed is planted, that when we are followers of Christ, that we're Christians? Is that we ought to live in such a way as that other people recognize that, that we bear fruit, good fruit, right? Amen. That he's saying, I, you didn't choose me, I chose you. In fact, I'll go a step further and say the Bible says is that except he calls you, you can't come to him. You might think, I'm going to get saved today. I'm going to come down to church. But if the Holy Spirit isn't drawing you, you know, just saying the words, the the things we used to kind of think, well, if I just pray this prayer. If I just say, because I know what to say. See, everybody knows. Well, I've said that before. But you know, if you don't say it from your heart, if you don't mean it from your heart, if there's no repentance, no remorse of sin in your life, how much good do you believe? Because God keeps his word. God says, whoever calls upon his name shall be saved. But if you'll go back in Romans 10, 13, and go back to verse 9 in Romans 10, it talks about that that if we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord, you know, that we shall be saved. The process of that coming to a, a sense of repentance and remorse within our life, that brings us to call upon him. It's like saying, have mercy upon me, O Lord. The Lord says, I chose you. So he came into the world that we might be saved. His name is called Jesus. The angel said, for he shall save his people from their sins. So he, he chooses. So that is, at, whether it's an early age, or what, that is the importance of preaching the gospel all around the world, to get the preached word of God out so that people know and have the opportunity and to see if that seed falls upon good soil. You know what I mean? If it takes root, And then it begins to bear forth fruit within the life because that's what a Christian ought to do. You are to be better, I ought to be better today in my Christian walk with Christ than I was the day I got saved. From that time, because it's matured, it's growth. It's it's beginning, as a tree begins to age and to grow, it begins to bear fruit. It blossoms out. We as Christians ought to do that. And so you think, what is that fruit? Well, let's move on. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So who do we ask? God the Father. And how do we ask? In the name of Jesus. What do we ask for? That is, that is in accordance to the will of God in our hearts. God knows our hearts. You know, if our hearts is right with God, we won't be selfish about what we're asking for. We'd be just like Jesus said, nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Oh, Lord, heal me. Do this or that. Or, Lord, be with this one or that one. And and, and then get turned off that we're asking, I need money. I need help, Lord. I need a job. I need this or that. When it comes into, I need, I need, I need. Don't you know that God knows what you need before you ask? But the Bible says you have not because you ask not. And also that sometimes you ask amiss. Ask in the wrong way. So Jesus said that your fruit may remain here in verse 16. That whatever you ask, so that is to know that it's at your... I have not left anything out to tell you about the Heavenly Father, Jesus says. And then in verse 17, just out of the clear blue, he says, These things I command you. That you love one another. Amen. These things and love is one of the fruits, one of the bases of understanding. So where is it, when is it that you compromise the convictions within your life that you stop loving? The Bible talks about love and says love covers a multitude of sins. Love is the most strong, the most powerful force in the world. That's to understand love, and, and when we look at it, but somehow or another that we've got to the point that in our Christianity today, Baptist, Methodist, our religion denominationally, if whatever we've got today is that somehow we've got lost and caught up in the fact of believing that we can just believe in whatever way we want to believe. Like, for example, we can separate politics and religion. You see, that gives us a justification or excuse for how we want to live in our political life. 
You know, that's like saying, I'm going to come to church on Sunday, but the rest of the week is my day. You know, everything else is going to be okay. It just truly blows me away to watch all the politicians that claims to be Christians and that claims to be this or that and then, but it goes totally against the grain of the denomination or whatever it is that they belong to. And I thought that's not so far-fetched from what sometimes we experience that when it comes into, and I'm wondering, do we really know what it is is that we belong to? Do we really know and understand what it is? I, I can remember a day when people were talking about, saying, well, I'm Baptist because, you know, Baptists were known to be uh, a church that believed the Bible the, of the Word. You know, I heard that 40 years ago when I started out about what Baptists were, why, why that it was Baptist, and then I had all my Pentecostal friends and different ones that was, they was talking about the Holy Spirit and things like that, and, and in and many of the Baptist churches, and as I started out, because I wasn't brought up in a Baptist church, is that I wasn't brought up in any church, and, and so I, I was looking at this, and so it seemed like they were shunning away from, and I'm saying, what are you talking about, you know? the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and, and tongues and healing and casting out demons and, and other, all the other things of, that was in the Bible, the Scriptures and things that say was in the Bible and, and all this. But you see, we say, well, I, I believe everything in the Bible except when it don't agree with what I believe. That's the way a lot of people are, isn't it? And, and one of my young men that surrendered, he, he far exceeded me. He... He, um, I'll give him credit, he surrendered at the ministry in uh, Owensboro, Kentucky, where I was pastor of church there. And his name was John Stamper, and he went on to become an associate pastor, youth pastor in some churches that were huge. Like, my goodness, they'd have 500 in their youth group where he was a pastor or something. Church might have 5,000 or 10,000. Going, I said, John, you just, you just exceeded beyond what anything I've ever reached that God used him in. And we were talking one day, and I remember him saying, you know, was talking about Baptists he knew, and I'd come down to speak to his youth group one time. And uh, he said, he said, really, he said, I'm not a bad, he said, I'm a biblicist. He said, if the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. I hadn't got too many amens on that one, but I think you're thinking it. I mean, I know you got the mask on. He said, a biblicist is someone who believes the Bible. If, that, if, you know, if the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. It's not, you know, I might have an opinion about it. I might have, I might have other thoughts and different things about it. So that's part of the conviction. We, don't, we ought not to ever compromise our convictions about the Bible because it is the inerrant, infallible word of God. And Jesus tells us, he gives us a command to say that we ought to love one another. So when we read in the Bible in Isaiah 49, verse 5, we read that God formed and called us from the womb. Remember, Jesus said, I chose you, you didn't choose me. Isaiah writes and says, And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb, the Lord formed me from the womb, Isaiah 49, verse 5, To bring Jacob again to him, though Israel be not gathered, shall, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. So the first thing I want you to notice today in looking at say, is that God has a purpose for our lives. God has a purpose for our lives. The only thing I've ever said in anywhere in all the years of mission is I want to be where the Lord wants me, doing what the Lord wants me to do when he wants me to do it. That has been my heart ever since I took off running this race to serve the Lord. And I have been in a lot of states. I've been in a lot of places. I've seen a lot of things. I've been in a lot of countries. I've been in all those things, all because of God, not because of me. But it was because as God would open the doors and he would say, you go do this, you do that. And, and because we grow, God puts us into church so we can grow and so we can serve. We enter to worship, we depart to serve. That when we're out there, we're missionaries, we're voices for the Lord. 
You see, we need to know what that purpose of God is in our life. And I think one thing is well defined that Jesus said here. He tells us to love one another. And, and when we see Jesus said, I command you in verse 17, I command you that you love one another. That's like saying, you know, you've got a house full of kids and you said, I'm telling you right now, you know, and they might not mean it when they say it. Uh, they say, you tell your brother you love him. You tell your sister. That's like saying, I say, I'm commanding you to do that. But it's also a thing, if your heart is right, it will be easy to do. You know? And that when that comes to the place, so we ought to love one another, and that's where Christians as believers need to start loving one another, whether they're of this church or that church or whatever. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if he's chose you, called you by the power of the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, is that we are one big family of God. Brother Odell, are you talking about a universal church? I say there is one church, and it's the body of Christ. But it is invisible at this time. It is not called together yet, but one glorious day is the bride of Christ that it will be. But Jesus commands us to love one another. Not only that, Jesus tells us here as we notice that you thought about the fact that he placed you here just not to be loved, but to love. The second thing you'll notice is love is expressed. You know, in John chapter 13, verse 12 through 17, I know that um, I've had people ask me before, so why don't we do this? Because it's in the Bible. Some people use it as a sense of um, a third ordinance in the church. The church has, an ordinance is a commandment. It says like taking, observing the Lord's Supper or uh, baptism. Those are two ordinances Jesus commands us to do, to go into all the way, Matthew 28, 19, 20, you know, teach, preach the gospel, and then baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us to do that. Also, about taking the Lord's Supper, the communion, the Passover. So there's two ordinances. And some people tie this one in. John chapter 13, foot washing. Jesus one day, because he had taught his disciples all these different things, and the custom in that day was is that when they entered into a house as they walked because with sandals or bare feet, when they would walk, their feet would be dirty and they'd enter in. And a servant or someone as hired employee would come with a pan of water and a towel that they would place their feet into that pan and they would wash their feet and then dry it with a towel. And this was the custom of the host of the home that would have that done for his guest when they were coming in. And the interesting part here in John chapter 13 Verse 12 through 17, it says, Jesus says, so when he had washed their feet, so he'd already take, done that, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. What Jesus was doing was simply expressing love to his disciples, showing how you love one another. It is humility. It is to humble yourself and to place yourself below that person. Like the Bible teaches us about a husband and a wife. How that a husband loves the wife, not to demean, not to say, you know, you speak when you're spoken to or whatever, to beat them down or to do whatever that we're at the cross. Christ made it, the ground was level that when we come to have that equality, although there's different forms of positions and authority of whatever takes place. But there was never a place to where we're saying that one person was not as important as another person to Christ. And so when we see this in Jesus wash their feet and you say well why don't we do that and I heard you all did that back a few years ago or something but it wasn't but it's a matter of having the right attitude when you do it you have to prepare yourself for that to do that that is a thing that is done he said you ought to he didn't command it to be done but like the church of brethren I think that's one of their ordinances that they do they practice to do those things nothing wrong with it it's okay but it's just a matter, and that's to say to come to, 
uh, uh, to go through or to participate in something if it's done in a right way and done at a right time that God leads you to do it. The Lord himself did this to his apostles, his disciples, to express what love really looked like when you put it into action. You know, it might be able to go and to help somebody, mow the yard, sweep the floor, do, do something, express a, more than just saying, I love you and I'm praying for you and doing all these things, is love expresses itself. And you can sometimes see that, you know, when you say you love me, but, you know, when our face doesn't show it, we tell God we love him, but when our heart isn't reflecting it, that it's his, love expresses when we do that we love the Lord. We come to church. We worship him. We pray. We witness for him. We give our offerings and our tithes. We do all the, we express our love as we're invited. We, we live our Christian life to the best of our ability. And when we fail, we admit our failures. We come back to him that we continue to come back and to be encouraged and strengthened and motivated within our life. So you don't need to compromise Christian convictions. The other thing you'll notice is that Jesus died for what he believed. Luke chapter 18, verse 31 through 33. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked, insulted, and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. We need to discover what is worth loving, what is worth living for, what is worth fighting for. In other words, we want to keep it. We don't want to let it go. That when those things come, to stand upon the principles that we have as a Christian and a believer. And I, I frankly believe that is what's happened to our country that appears to be trying, if we're not careful, it's going to slip away uh, and just, just drift out into the darkness. If, if we're not careful that we're letting, we're letting evil take over from good, and, and you know, we've got to let our light shine, and, and Christians need to be standing up, and, and we need to let that love and, and that willingness of life, and we need to take a stand for Christ. Jesus died for what he believed in, and, and many of us won't say anything because we're afraid of what we might say or offend somebody. The Bible in James 4.17 says, To him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it's sin. It's never wrong to do the right thing, dear friend, at the right time. Sometimes I know that we can say things or do things that are not in the timing, the perfect timing of doing things that we just force it through. You know, because we know we're standing on truth and we're doing it, but we don't do it in love. And that's the difference. It's about attitude. It's about the way that we do things. Do you remember the fourth thing and last today? Do you remember the story of Gideon? It's in Judges chapter 6, verse 36 through 40. Gideon was a judge, and Gideon was called of God to, to take over this nation, to lead as a judge, but he felt so unqualified. He just didn't feel capable of doing that when God spoke to his heart. And, and Gideon, in Judges chapter 6, verse 36 through 40, um, he just, God was sending him out against the Mennonites, enemy of Israel. And it just seemed like that, you know, he just, nobody's wanting to fight. They, they didn't want to do it. You know, that, that's the way it is, trying to get somebody, you know, it's like, say, we go out to the highways and hedges and invite them to come in to church, you know, to come in to worship. Or, or we just think, why isn't everybody in the house of God? You know, the real danger here today with this, that we've been attacked by this China virus, the real danger of, of how it's instilled fear into too many hearts and, and, you know, until we get to the place to where we, our faith is a lot stronger than our fear, we're not going to survive. Because if we live in those shadows of doing it, it's not a matter of being, I guess, crazy, reckless. But it's a matter of having faith and being strong to take a stand to know that God's got this. There's not anything of whatever's going to happen as we go through things 
within our life, but to look at the impact, whether it's upon the economy of our nation, whether it's upon churches, how it's going to impact. Can you, you know, I'm hearing pastor, I'm hearing him talk about how that their attendance is dwelling down into the church and their offerings and different things because people get comfortable as we're staying back and that we forget the obligations that we have as Christians, you know, because we support what we believe in. We support the cause of whatever we do, and if we're not careful that we get to a point of convenience of where it takes and that we forget about being able to give and contribute financially or our prayers or physically or to do whatever we can do. And certainly it's understandable for those that, you know, some people can't because they're sick and health reasons and things like that. But again, I say God knows the heart. You know, we're not going to fake God out, you know, and if you want to see something on that, read Acts chapter 5. And you'll see the great pretenders there, Quill and Priscilla, you know, you're, you're, when they go into the, uh, about their offerings and about their worship of the Lord, and they're trying, they sell property and things like that. So when you, you know, look at that, and they, they both died because they both lied. The fact is, God knows the truth about us, don't he? You know, God knows everything within our heart. You see, Jesus was willing to die for what he believed in. What did he believe in? Is that he was the Lamb of God. He was the Messiah. He was coming. And that it took his death to make the propitiation, the covering of our sins upon an old rugged cross. That Christ laid his life down. He expressed his love to us. And throughout history, God has called people and chose people for certain times. And just like with Gideon. It says in Judges chapter 6, verse 36 through 40, Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. So, and that's what happened when Gideon went out the next morning, early in the day. He's, he squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew in a bowl full of water. The ground was dry, but the fleece was wet. But sometimes we're like Gideon. Gideon, that wasn't enough like that. And he thought, well, maybe that was coincidental. You know, I asked God to do something, and I just can't look at it and see that God is trying to show me. God's telling me something. And so Gideon said in verse 39, do not be angry with me, Lord. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with this fleece. This time, make the fleece dry and the ground wet all around it. And that night, God did. And Gideon, in the same thing, when he got up the next morning, and there, here's the ground just ringing wet with you, and, and the fleece, he picked it up. It was just dry, like it had been through a real nice Maytag clothes dryer. He just picked it up. There was no dew. That could, man, it was dry. You know, that was just, but that, that sounds simple to you and I, but I want to tell you something. That was important to Gideon. You know, sometimes God gives you a sign. God speaks to your heart. He shows you something. He says, well, I've already done this. I've already done that or whatever. You know, we like to, and we're not supposed to tempt the Lord. But we do test it. We do put it to the taste. Say, Lord, if that be you. And that was the way that the apostles did after Judas went off and hung himself over the cliff and died. And, and they come to find another one to take his place that they cast lots. They were asking, Lord, show us, Lord, show us. What is your will, Lord? And sometimes we have to pursue when we come to the place is that we understand God does speak. I'm not going to compromise my convictions to believe in who God is and what God wants within my life. When God calls us to move forward, we need to move forward within our life. And if that is the conviction that you have within your heart, you ought not to compromise it. Gideon started out when he said, okay, I'm going to go fight, and Gideon had a plan for it. He got 32,000. He thought numbers was the thing. 32,000 men to fight against the Midianites. When they gathered down, God said, that's too many. And then Gideon cut it down to 10,000. And God said, that's too many. Can you imagine? And then Gideon had to cut it down to 300. From 32,000 to 300 to fight against this great nation of the Midianites. You know why that God wanted to do that? You know why it doesn't? You know, it's so much easier to serve God in the sense of, it's so much easier for me as a pastor and saying, preaching to a thousand people. And coming in or looking and said, we got people running over to be able to do things and all these different things. 
But when you come down to the fact that you see that you have a small church or body, you think, we're small, we're insignificant. No, you're not. No, we're not. We're not insignificant to God because sometimes God works through the smallness to be able to reflect and show us that of his greatness. And he says, we can't do it on our own. You don't do it through numbers. You don't do it through your availability and success and all the different things you have. But it takes faith and believing. Do you believe that God can work through this within your life? So if you do, because whatsoever is not of faith, the Bible says, is sin. So when we come to, in Gideon's story helps to remind us to say, you know, we may have to, as we cut down and we are small here, look and say the COVID, the enemy is telling you, it's so enormous and saying, what can we do? We are so small. We have to have a willingness in our hearts to serve the Lord. We have to know why that we are here today. We have to know why, as God has called us to say, in our hearts, not because of anybody else, a British soldier was parading himself proudly in front of a captured American officer. And the American officer asked the British soldier as he was marching in front of the sail, walking, and said, he said, why are you fighting this battle? And the British soldier said to the American prisoner, I'm fighting for my queen. And then as the British soldier was marching in front, he said, why are you fighting? He said, I am fighting for my liberty. And I want you to know today when you look at it, see that what we do as Christians and what we do as Americans is that we lay our life down on the line for, the, that for, for freedom and liberty and truth and the pursuit of happiness within our life. There is a reason that we fight this battle. And when there's a reason that we have, there's a just cause that we know, and so we take hold of that to say that if God be with us, who can be against us? You see, if God is working in our behalf and saying when you come down, and you know Gideon with his army, he was able to conquer the Midianites with that 300. And God told them how to do it, and they had pots and pans, which is an amazing thing as they was going up against them. And they were running. God put fear into the enemy's hearts. You see, if the devil's putting fear into our hearts, fear doesn't come from God. We might have a fear and a respect for an awesome God. But to fear our life and what's going to happen to us is that, you know, if we, when we die and we have this fear that's coming in, so, you know, we are to believe the word of Jesus says, in my Father's house is many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. That when that time comes, we know that it's going to be okay. Because he has promised we got the word of God. We have victory. And so don't compromise your convictions, the convictions of the word of God. The apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, 16 and says, For if I preach not the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And you know what the gospel is? It is the word means good news. Good news. So I'm asking you today, in your life, don't compromise your convictions about the good news and let the bad news overshadow you. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for blessing us today as we meet together in your house. And Lord, in this invitation, that whatever the response publicly, privately that we make of recommitting our life to you, giving our hearts to you, following you, Lord. Because we know that without you, we can do nothing. We are nothing. So I just ask you, Father, to speak to us and to help us to respond accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me, please, as we sing in our invitation hymn this morning. You need to come around this altar to pray. You need to make a decision for Christ. Whatever God says to you, you come. Back of the church, the front, the middle. Without Him, I truly. 
Without Him I would be drifting like a ship without a I hope those that are home are singing that with us as we respond to the invitation. Lift Him up. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know Him today? Do not turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, without him how lost. Let's do that next verse, Billy, as we worship the Lord together. Without him I could be dying, without Without him, life would be hopeless. But with Jesus, thank God, I'm saved. Amen. Amen. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. And all God's people said, Amen. Do we have a word from anyone before we go today? Been good to be in the house of the Lord again. And to see each of you. I love you. What a good crowd this morning at 830. Thank you for coming. And I hope you'll stay for Sunday school. There's a class for you. If there isn't, I can show you where there is one. We appreciate you so much. So let's I'll get back.